up here is the very young Chris Kiefer, my assistant teacher. Um, and <clears throat> and it was basically this, this poster, and it actually shows the bread that it's eating. And it has this, it has a little, uh, it's hard to see, it has a little Chris Kiefer face here. Um, and, it, and it has an arm boy uh, running next to the <coughs> on arm transportation system. And so it was kind of a bit of a joke, but it, it uh, sort of emphasizes this, you know, Nazis can run from all the things that the poor can run from, <coughs> both of them. Um, and so uh, that is kind of, um, that has for, long, for a long time been the sort of stance of the Nazis. Like, you can run around whatever you want. Thank you. 
work. Uh, it's nothing else. You can install this as a learning opportunity, find out about how pu uh, about publicity works, <laughs> and consequently, maybe learn a bit more about how learning applications work. So I think it's a valuable thing. Um, and also, NetBSD has a, a nice compromise between the old school and the new school, because it, is, uh, it traces a direct heritage to uh, the old systems that you were at the Unix Victory talk yesterday, um, they made changes to the old systems. Uh, Thank you. Um, they essentially forked uh, uh, Unix in the early 70s, about 1973-74, um, and it, the NetBSD system today is a direct uh, descendant of that uh, line of development. Um, and on the other hand, you have modern features. Like the first thing you'll notice if you boot it on, say, your laptop, is that it'll boot in, not into text mode, but into a graphical console um, using the full resolution of your display. Um, and that graphical console is accelerated. Uh, so NetBSD these days has uh, um, well-working graphics drivers for things such as NVIDIA cards, uh, Intel integrated graphics, whatnot. Um, and so even your text console is, has these. Uh, you have ZFS, which is a big deal. It's a new, new feature in NetBSD 9. It has a few limitations. It's not quite as powerful as in FreeBSD. But uh, but you have ZFS. Um, you can have uh, LVM, the logical volume manager. Uh, so you have flexible ways of, of defining your storage. Um, and you have a bunch of other server features. If you want to use it as a server, that's good. You have support for a, a lot of programming languages. Um, like uh, Go, for example, supports NetBSD well. Uh, Maya just did a talk in the Go dev room about porting it to more architectures. There's uh, C, C++, obviously. Uh, Ruby, Python, Perl, uh, Raku, uh, you name it, OCaml, it's all there. Um, and, in, and it also makes a surprisingly useful desktop OS uh, these days. Uh, you have a bunch of um, desktop environments such as Mate and XFCE available. Uh, you have browsers such as Firefox and, and Midori. Uh, you have like GIMP and LibreOffice, like it's all it's all kind of there. Um, and with the graphics acceleration, like you can install Firefox, you can go to YouTube, YouTube works. That was not the case a few years ago. Here's an example for a uh, for a desktop usage. Uh, somebody from Japan running NetBSD on a laptop with an internal digitizer's display and just drawing casually on it. Um, also, NetBSD is kind of, uh, I feel, one of the systems that's most at home in the cloud. Uh, first of all, there's at least three different hypervisors that are now uh, on the system. You have uh, Xen, which, which has been there for a long time. Uh, and it's really kind of enterprise grade. Um, you can, so on Xen, you run uh, your, your main machine is called the DOM0, uh, and then you can run guest domains in it, and for example, running NetBSD, running Windows, running whatever you want, um, that works. Um, there is a new hypervisor in NetBSD 9 called NVMM that is very intriguing. Uh, it's, a, it's a tiny library and a tiny kernel module. It's, it's very elegant in how it's written, and it also like, was written in a few weeks' time, apparently. And it's, it's kind of similar to KVM in Linux, uh, essentially, it provides you, the way it's implemented now, it provides you with an accelerated KVM, uh, accelerated QMU. So you can run your guest in, in regular QMU and set the accelerator to, to NVMM, and you get native-like speeds. Um, there's another hypervisor uh, called Hexam. Uh, it also plugs into uh, QMU. Uh, that is, uh, that's a sort of multi-platform thing, uh, and it's used, for example, in Android Studio to run, to power the Android emulator. So that also works on NetBSD these days. Um, then if you want to run NetBSD in the cloud, um, we have official images for AWS uh, AMIs for both Intel platform and ARM platform, 32-bit, uh, 64-bit. The ARM ones are fairly intriguing also because the, the ARM offerings from AWS are cheaper 
and faster. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, there's there's other uh, other cloud providers where it also works. There's uh, some people are using Vulture, some people are using uh, Scaleway, which also has cheap and high performance ARM stuff. It's all there. For a Google Compute Engine, we have uh, the staging script here uh, that works well. Um, and and finally, I think uh, what I would like to emphasize, it's also an OS that has a, a fairly welcoming community. This is a picture from uh, the Package Source Con 2019 in Cambridge. Um, it's sort of the group picture. Uh, about half of the people there are developers, I think. Um, and I think there's been some sort of generational change in, in the NetBSD project over the f last few years. It used to be a bunch of uh, sort of gray beards, if you will, like a bunch of old school Unix types. And nowadays, there's been a, a strong influx of younger people. Um, and as a result, the system has modernized quite a bit, which is, which is nice. Uh, so it's a community that, that is living and that renews itself. Um, and yeah, I like it a lot. Then I think maybe my favorite point uh, my favorite thing about NetPC is the package tree. Uh, it's called Package Source, uh, written PKG SRC. Um, and it has more than 20,000 packages, plus if you count uh, the work in progress ones, that's another 4,500. Um, and Package Source cannot be used just on NetBSD. It, it supports uh, about 18 different OSs and, and architectures. So whether you run you know, a Mac laptop, a Chromebook, uh, uh, a Linux server, you can use package source on, on all of these, uh, which is really cool. Um, and uh, the, way, uh, the way it works for a user is that there are uh, quarterly stable branches. The last one is called 2019Q4 because it was released at the end of the fourth quarter 2019. Um, and so, so these, these remain stable for, for three months. And during those three months, uh, uh, when there are security updates or build fixes or things like that, they're pulled up into the stable tree. Um, then there are like build bots that build binary packages uh, for certain architectures um, from, from this branch. And they, they run in the loop. So every time there's like a security update, all the stuff gets rebuilt. Uh, that depends on it. And, and you, have, you can use a uh, package manager called package in. It's sort of like apt get in a way um, to keep your system up to date really easily. Um, however, if there are no binary packages, for example, you're, I don't know, using the latest current or uh, on a weird architecture of some sort, like on your VEX or whatever, um, <laughs> that's no problem. You can easily build stuff from source. Here's an example if you want to build Firefox, uh, which might take a while in your VEX. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you just uh, change into the directory for this particular uh, package and, and type make package install, and it'll automatically do whatever is necessary, like find out what the dependencies are that need to be installed first, uh, download the source code, build it, build a package, install the package, and so on, until uh, something fails or you have you know, a working Firefox. Um, if you're using that, uh, like if you don't, if you're not depending on binary packages, but using building stuff from source, there's a tool called package rolling replace that's kind of <laughs> useful. Whenever you do an update of your package source tree, like say updating to a new quarterly release or something like that, you just run package rolling release dash u, like update, and then it'll automatically find out what packages you have installed are outdated compared to you know what's in the repository and then rebuild them in the correct order. So like the things that are lower in the dependency tree come first. Um, so you can do that once. It'll also take a while. And then you have up-to-date packages. It's really nice. Uh, compared to um, if you add ZFS in the mix, if you have your, your package directory under ZFS, you can do a snapshot before you start. And you know if, if you're scared that things might go horribly wrong, uh, if they do, you can just roll back that snapshot really nice. Um, also, I found that package source is one of the easiest ways of actually creating your own package. Um, there's a tool called URL to package where you give it a download URL to the source and it'll start building a skeleton for you and then you just fill out stuff. 
it's really easy. And there's sort of a gateway drug to becoming a uh, package source developer. Uh, which is, there's a staging repository called uh, package source WIP, work in progress. Um, and it's, it's really easy to get an account for that. Uh, you don't have to become like fully a NetBSD developer or anything like that. Uh, you just send a mail to the owner of this uh, repository and attach a public SSH key, and then you're in, more or less. Um, and so, uh, so package source WIP is several things. Uh, it's you know it's kind of a test bed. Uh, uh, it is. If you're a contributor, but you don't, you're not a developer, it's a way of uh, where you can put, say, a package that you made changes to. You just commit it into WIP, and it's a lot easier than attaching a, a patch to a mail or something like that because you can actually review it. Uh, some people like when they start working on a new package and they realize like I won't finish this today. This is not building correctly or something. They still commit what they have into WIP, and then others can continue on that. It's also like it's it's really. It's really good. Uh, as a user, you should know the packages that are in there might be slightly broken. Um, typically, there's a to-do file if they are. And so if there's a to-do file, you should read that before you install it. Anyway. Um, and now I want to take a little break uh, and do a, a tiny retrospective on my talk from last year, if you remember that. Uh, that was called an update on NetBSD. It's kind of similar to this one. Um, and back then, I was actually uh, talking about NetBSD 8, which was the all, all new release back then. Um, and NetBSD 8 uh, uh, is, now, you know, is now stable, and 9 is coming up. Um, it took over a year uh, from the time when it, the, the NetBSD 8 branch was cut from the, from the development branch to the release of NetBSD 8.0, and it was a kind of a long time, and a lot of people were kind of nervous about it. Um, and I realized when preparing this talk that it's almost as long already for NetBSD 9, but I think we're really, really close. Um, unfortunately, it's not there yet. So the branch from the development tree was uh, on, at the end of July 2019. You might remember that the uh, middle of July 2019 was when 8 was released. Basically, as soon as we were, as we got rid of one beta branch, we created another. Um, and I think the same is going to happen after 9 is done. Um, and I actually asked uh, Martin Husemann, who is the uh, release manager for NetBSD, uh, if we would have, if I could announce this release at FOSTEM, if we would have a release. And he was like, no. <laughs> How However, um, there's a release candidate number two that he promised me would be released now. It is also not really, but it should be any day now. So there's, gonna, uh, there's a release candidate one that is from late November, and release candidate two is coming because there were uh, some, some no, uh, bugs fixed since then. Um, and I think. Uh, if I were you, if I were starting with NetBSD, I would start with NetBSD 9, whatever state it is in at that point. Um, as I said, ZFS is, and NVMM are sort of the big new headline features. Um, there's, I, I talked about the, the accelerated graphics drivers earlier. There was a big update to those. Uh, so if your graphics card is you know, less than three years old, then you may want to install this. Um, and then in terms of the hardware support, uh, there's, there's a lot of improvements in uh, the ARM architecture. Uh, it's called EVB ARM evaluation boards with the ARM architecture, but it's, it's really all sorts of things, including like laptops and stuff. Um, in particular, uh, EVB ARM now has 64-bit support. So on a Raspberry Pi, for example, you can install it in 64-bit mode, and you get a bit more performance. It's really nice. Um, for developers, you have a bunch of sanitizers, uh, both in the kernel and in the uh, in the user land. So you can run your your code against uh, UBSAN and ASAN and TSAN and whatever their names are, and find bugs. There have been a bunch of bugs found in NetBSD itself, obviously, and fixed. There have been a bunch of security improvements. Um, uh, uh, our security folks are particularly proud of this thing called kernel ASLR, which does full randomization 
of all the kernel addresses uh, to make exploit development more difficult. And it does that by um, adding another stage between the bootloader and the kernel. So it loads something called a pre-kernel that'll uh, load the actual kernel, rejigger all the stuff, and then start it. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, and now, you know, maybe I have convinced you now that NetPST is a cool operating system. So I want to address the, the question, like, what are you going to run it on? Of course, you could run it on the laptop you already have or the desktop you already have, which is probably an AMD 64, I guess, like a 64-bit Intel or AMD CPU. Um, but there's also more interesting machines, um, most of them incidentally running ARM. Uh, here's one that you probably all know, uh, the Raspberry Pi, $35. Um, reasonable performance, doesn't blow anyone away really. Um, and you have wireless LAN, you have Bluetooth, you have a uh, bunch of like extension thingies you can install, I don't know, LEDs on the I2C board and on the, on the, the bus. Uh, it's a cool hacker toy. Uh, you know, why not, why not buy one of these and use NetBeast on it? Uh, you may wonder why I showed the Raspberry Pi 3 and not the 4, which is because the 4 doesn't quite work out of the box. Uh, so there, <laughs> there is this thing here. You have to download an image and then untar this file on top of the FAT partition for people who are looking into the, like, uh, this is more for reference if you're looking into how to get it working. But the Raspberry Pi 4 works with this. Uh, here's another one uh, that I'm very excited about and a lot of other people as well, I think. Uh, the Pinebook Pro, I think they might have a presence here at FOSTEM. They might have a stand outside. Um, the Pinebook Pro is a, is a laptop uh, running an ARM processor, um, and it is uh, $199, so it's really cheap, but it is really high quality as well. Uh, it, its predecessor, the Pinebook, without the Pro, was a little bit more sort of n like a netbook, if you remember those. But this one here is like superb keyboard, uh, great build quality. Um, it's really a, a notebook that you know doesn't have to hide between uh, behind like the Apple stuff or whatever. And it's two hundred dollars, and it will run NetBSD uh, natively. Um, so here's one of our developers, Jared McNeil, who are making uh, uh, some publicity for this. So you see display, backlight control, uh, SD card, NVMe, USB Wi-Fi audio and I don't know what DVFS is, are all supported. Um, so you can download an image there on armbsd.org or on the NetBSD uh, site and just write it onto a SD card, put it in the, the, the Pinebook Pro. Superb. And that's really all I have. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yes. The minimum amount of RAM you need for to run uh, ZFS decently. The minimum amount of RAM for ZFS. Um, I think technically is one gigabyte, but if you have less than four, you might not be super happy with it. Huh? Yes. Does it support hardware hardware acceleration on the Pinebook Pro? Hardware acceleration on the Pinebook Pro. I'm not sure. I don't think it does. Yes. Would you say is the performance of that new hypervisor compared to older ones, especially compared to Beehive? Uh, what is the performance of NVMM compared to Beehive? Maybe the question should be why didn't you? Why did why does it not Beehive? Um, I think the the reason why it's not Beehive is that it was easier writing this from scratch than porting Beehive, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's really very minimal. Uh, I, I don't have I don't have any performance data compared to Beehive. I don't know. Um, so as far as I know, Beehive is free BSD only. Is that correct? And uh, Lumos. Andy Lumos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question was, what is the glue language of package source? Um, and um, saying OpenBSD has a lot of Perl, uh, uh, FreeBSD has a lot of Lua. A package source is a lot of make. <laughs> um, 
like the 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 main control file for a, for a package is a make file. Um, behind the scenes, there are a bunch of scripts that are um, that are awk and Z and so on, um, and a few C programs. For example, we have uh, wrappers around uh, the C compiler and around the um, linker and all of that, and they're written in C, so you don't lose too much performance. And that way, even if a build system is behaving badly, we can be sure that the arguments we really want to be there are sort of injected into the command line. That's what the wrappers do. Any more? Yes? Can I do GPU pass through to virtual machines with VMM or X? Can you do GPU pass through? I don't think you can. I think the, the display is always emulated. You might be able to do it with Xen, but it's a bit, it's, it's hard to to do get right, I think. But you might be. Yes? What customizes does MVMM support? All of them, really. Um, it's, uh, it's as generic as, as KVM. Um, and because, it's, because you have um, uh, QMO, uh, you get emulated devices for things like network. Or if uh, the guest OS has uh, proper guest support, uh, you'll get um, uh, non-emulated devices. All right, thank you very much.